Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. I appreciate it. So I'm Gretchen Stewart, and I'm going to pull up some slides to kick this off. So again, thanks so much for joining us. So we're going to talk about one API today, and I am smart enough to know that I need to bring experts to come uh, chat about uh, this great software that we've developed So um, and the frameworks that we've designed. So I wanted to um, just kick this off, and then I will turn it over. So as we, as we Intel have been looking at, as we call it, our six pillars, the one thing I want to highlight is it's all wrapped around software. So as you think about Intel, you think of us as a hardware company. We have memory. We're designing um, XPUs, i.e. GPUs and CPUs. We have FPGAs. We have some of the best fab plants around the globe. And yet software is really critically important to ensure that you're able to take advantage of all of those components that Intel builds. So as we talk through today, um, Kent Moffat, who is the uh, One API product manager, um, I just wanted to set the stage. So in the past, we've talked a bit about our AI and analytics toolkits. We've also done some work um, and we presented jointly with Deloitte and we highlighted our computer vision and the open Vino work. And so I really just wanted to show you that one API is what all of this is built on. So um, Kent is going to talk about one API, but again, it is the basis for the, the software that we're building. It includes the libraries and the toolkits that are absolutely what you will need to build um, current and future uh, products. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kent. Kent needs to come off mute. Thank you for the reminder. You are welcome. Let me start with uh, talking about the motivation for One API. Um, then I'll step into the One API industry initiative, what we're trying to grow across the industry, and then talk more about the Intel tools that are built on that and kind of circle back to show how that includes the AI tools and things as well as the, the more native language level tools that are part of One API. So um, the programming challenge we have is, is, oops, we're still back on the last one, Gretchen, um, is for multiple architectures. Um, that, so we want to have a single programming environment that, actually, could you go two back, Gretchen? Sure. Yeah. There we go. OK. So the, the motivation for this is growth and specialized workloads demanding really a, a, a variety of architectures. Um, the challenge, and those could be, you know, CPU, GPU, FPGA, dedicated AI architectures or, or others. The, the challenge is that today those each require a different programming model. Um, so in different tool chains. So any code you write for one is, is difficult to repurpose uh, to use on another. And of course, we know a lot of development, you end up reusing parts of things before. So that gets in the way. Um, and different tool chains you have to use. So, so that's new things to learn, and that, that's another drag on, on developer productivity. So all that extra complexity and productivity drag really uh, limits freedom of architectural choice. You, if you've designed on GPU before, you're probably inclined to stay there because it's difficult to move the code. Same for FPGAs, et cetera. So that's where we come to, to one API. Next slide, Gretchen. Um, and we have this, we want this common layer of, of uh, language and libraries. And so we have both the industry initiative part of it and the Intel product part of it I'll talk about. And the idea is to then give you the freedom to make your best choice across architectures and not feel like you're limited by where your existing legacy code might have been developed for. Um, and do this based on industry standards so you, you feel safe that if you develop code, you're not going to be stuck with one vendor, that kind of a thing. And also compatibility and evolution from existing programming methods. You know, there's a lot of C++, Fortran, OpenMP, et cetera, code out there. You don't want to have to give up any of that. So all these new programming techniques we talk about um, will be compatible with those those other ones as well, and it's really an evolutionary move from um, from where you've been on CPU or individual GPU vendor programming to this this shared model. Okay, next slide. So let's talk, start off by talking about the industry initiative, and there are three main parts to that industry initiative. 
First, there's the data parallel C++ language, or DPC++. And this is all based on C++ and the emerging SQL standard from the Kronos group. We'll talk a little bit more about those in, in another slide. Then we've got the, the libraries, um, or what we call API-based programming. So a bunch of different libraries in different domains. You can see them there. We'll talk through those in more detail later, so I won't talk too much about them now. Um, but those are all libraries that are intended to be cross-architecture and are, are based on open specs in the industry initiative. And then the thing at the bottom, the low-level hardware interface, we call that level zero. And that's really a way for other people to develop tools on top of those architectures. Level zero is starting off focused on GPU, and we've already had a number of outside organizations, universities, et cetera, develop tools to that API um, to work with our GPUs. Um, bottom line is this is supposed to be a productive smart path to freedom for accelerated computing without the barriers of you know, proprietary methods. You know, nobody wants a different language for each vendor's GPU or each vendor's new architecture. That would be a nightmare. So uh, the idea is to try to try to bring some commonality and, and get everybody on the same page. Okay, next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about the data parallel C++ language. And uh, it's, we say DPC++ is ISO C++, so standard, you know, world standard C++. Um, and the chrono sickle spec and community extensions that, that, that we're adding as we work with developers and, and other experts in the community. Um, and again, this is all about freedom choice. So you want to allow code reuse across these targets. Um, but we certainly, you certainly need to do some specific tuning to each target. You know, this isn't something like a Java write once, one everywhere where you're willing to sacrifice performance to, to get that commonality. You know, if you're using accelerators, you, you really want, you know, high performance or you wouldn't be adding that, that part to your system. So you do need to do some, you know, some accelerator specific tuning, but, but a lot of the code can be reused and certainly a lot of your, your training, your expertise with the tool chain because it's, it's common across architectures can be used too. Um, and the whole idea is that this language is, is open cross industry standard, and that's why it's based on an ISO C++ and, and Sickle. Um, you get all the benefits, you know, C++ familiarity. So developers who know C++, this will look quite familiar to them. There's not a, not a, a learning curve there. Um, and Sickle is what really provides the heterogeneous offload semantics. So whatever you want to offload from the CPU to one of these accelerators, you use these sickle constructs um, that were pioneered by Kronos. And then as we've worked with, with language experts and with developers, we've added extensions, our, and then we drive those extensions into future versions of sickle. So you, you may have seen that sickle 2020 was just released that included several major enhancements that we drove, um, including things like unified shared memory that came from the community and sub, subgroups. So those are in Sickle 2020, and over time we expect the differences between our DPC++ implementation and the Sickle standard will, will, will go down. There'll be very little daylight between those, you know, once those extensions and, and are in and Sickle has become a little bit more mature. Uh, and then the goal is to drive all this, this Sickle content into the ISO C++ standard. That just takes a while, and that's why we, we've kind of have a tight iteration loop with our developers and people on extensions to Sickle. Then we're working with Kronos and all the companies and, and other parties involved there. And then since ISO C++ is on a longer, like five, 10 year kind of, you know, change cycle, um, we'll do that if it, when the right time comes. But we're trying to sort of crawl, walk, run, you know, up this ladder to, uh, to full C++ standardization. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Um, so let's look at the libraries, and uh, you may recognize some of the names here if you've used some, some Intel tools in the past. Um, all of these libraries come out of a history of being used on Intel CPUs for many years. In some cases, we've, we've changed the names to make them a little more descriptive, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go through them. But they all have a long history of use on CPU. They've been well optimized and well used by, by thousands or if not hundreds of thousands of developers uh, in that context. So the first one is the 1API math kernel library. So again, this is one we've had on CPU for a long time, but we've now opened the specs. 
um, and and added the the one API uh, just to kind of uh, give it a moniker as part of this standard. And then the one API video processing library um, includes codecs, video pre-processing, post-processing. That one we used to call Media SDK. We've added a lot of capability to it, but it but it includes the most of the capabilities that the previous Media SDK did. If you're familiar with that one, um, one API threading building blocks primarily for task parallelism. That's another one we've had for a long time. Um, the DPC++ library is a superset of parallel standard template library, which we've delivered with our compilers, our C++ compilers, for some time. Um, and, and similar to other parallel STL implementations you might have used out there. Um, and then the Deep Neural Network Library, we used to call this one MKL DNN, now it's one DNN. Um, and that's used primarily to optimize deep learning frameworks. So someone who, who works on deep learning frameworks or kind of equivalent you know, type of deep learning software would use this to optimize to our architectures or to any architecture support. In fact, um, there was a Fujitsu did an implementation on the Fugaku supercomputer recently using one DNN. So we are seeing um, some uptake of these standards by other vendors um, outside of Intel. Um, then we have the one API data analytics library, and that's mainly uh, machine learning, statistical or, or other types. Um, we used to call this one the data analytics acceleration library. So we, we tweaked it a little bit, but uh, largely the same, same library expanded to work on multiple architectures. And then the collective communications library, which is really a, a, a library to distribute compute for AI, whether it's deep learning or machine learning across multiple nodes in a, in a cluster or in your data, set, data center. We used to call this one the machine learning scaling library, but, uh, but we, we've changed the name on that one for more industry standard terminology. So these are the libraries that we've sort of standardized as part of the one API specs. We also stood up open source projects around these. Our, our goal is to make it as easy as possible for other companies, other organizations to adopt these. Um, most of these we had open source projects in the past, um, but we've expanded on those and, and we'll continue to do that over time to, to try to jumpstart the, the use of these uh, in, the, in the industry. Okay, next slide. So we talked, I talked a little bit about the one DNN spec being adopted. Um, we also have worked with a couple parties on data parallel C++ and Sickle um, to, to uh, support those on, our, on other companies' architectures. So as you see, we've had all these industry initiative specs, and that's evolved to a, um, a 1.0 spec. And we'll, we'll keep going. We're going to add more domains and, and, and uh, more capability. But what I wanted to highlight was in the bottom there, you see that there's a there's a one API implementation for or a compiler implementation for NVIDIA GPUs. And that was added to the open source one API DPC plus plus compiler by by Codeplay, who's a, as a big, big player in the in the sickle community. And then University of Heidelberg, which already had a sickle implementation, it was to the sickle 1.2.1 spec. Um, they had a sickle implementation to AMD GPUs, and we work with them to enhance that for the new DPC++ features that, that are going into sickle 2020. So the, the value of these is that if you move to DPC++, you also want a path probably to program other companies' hardware besides Intel's, and, and these are two paths to, to get there. Okay, next slide. Um, and just this slide is just a, a, you know, a set of companies who have expressed support for one API. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, nobody wants a scenario where there's, you know, a different set of tools for every architecture or a different set of tools for every vendor's GPU or something like that. Um, and so, as you can imagine, there's there's a lot of a lot of support behind this idea. You know, everyone likes the benefits that you can get. You know, you can get a C++ compiler for basically any CPU, any performance-oriented CPU. Well, people want that, that same kind of value and situation in the accelerator space. Next slide. So just to highlight a couple of, uh, of major players who, who, uh, who, who have, can move the market, um, who, who've, who've contributed or endorsed one API. The first one is TensorFlow, and we've worked with the TensorFlow team for quite some time to do optimization on Intel Xeon, um, and we've been doing that for years now. Um, but now we're working with them also to support our other accelerators, GPUs, et cetera. 
Um, and to them, one API is great because again, they they're they're one of those parties that would have to do use many different languages, many different libraries, et cetera, across different architectures, and that just that just adds up to being a lot of unnecessary development work. Another one here is uh, Microsoft Azure, um, their cloud business, and and they're particularly focused on AI and machine learning here. Again, you know, they want to have they want to be able to develop, you know, optimize these not have to rewrite the code from scratch for each vendor, et cetera. Um, and I don't have it up here, but another one I'll just mention is um, that the, the Gromax team in HPC for doing a lot of, um, you know, biological work, um, they have said that, you know, this is so important to them, they would accept even some trade-off in performance on each platform just to be able to move to a single language and be able to leverage their, their resources better across those. So, um, so anyway, I think there's a lot of motivation. We're still really early in this, um, but but I think there's a lot of demand in there, and people would would like to see this uh, this sort of thing. Okay, next slide. So let's let's switch gears a little bit now and talk about the One API product, um, Intel's implementation, if you will, of of the One API standards. Um, and our toolkit implementation, as you see, goes beyond some of these standards as well because. These were new things we thought that the, the market needed, um, but there's a lot of other technology that we can, we've can we shipped for a long time and will continue to that's important to customers. So for instance, you know, Fortran is a very important language in HPC we can even support, and, and you'll see that in the toolkits. Python, OpenMP, right? These are, these are major uh, standards that aren't going anywhere. So that's all compatible. It's just that those are existing standards. We don't need to drive new standards in an industry initiative there. They're already well established though. So we just provide tools that support those. Um, so let's look, take a look at the diagram a bit. And uh, first I'll point out, you've got the language and libraries and the, in the low level hardware interface in the center there that we talked about already as part of the, the industry initiative. But then you've also got this compatibility tool, or its, it's full name is the Intel uh, DPC++ compatibility tool, and that's for migrating CUDA code into DPC++. And I'll, I'll talk about that in another slide soon. Um, the whole goal there is just, you know, you, you, you'd like to be able to, to not have to rewrite all that from scratch, and so this, this tool helps uh, automate some of that, uh, that, that drudgery. And then you've got analysis and debug tools. And if you're familiar with some of the ones we've had in the market, like VTune and Advisor, and then we also use the, the GDB debugger, and we enhance that to work across all the architectures. So we'll talk about those. Um, and other libraries as well that'll come up that you'll, you'll see as we go forward. And then in the middleware and frameworks level, this is where you see a lot of the AI tools. So customers that work at the, say, the TensorFlow level, or in the classic machine learning space, they might work with Scikit-Learn or XGBoost. So those are all things that people tend to use more at the, the Python level, um, but they're, they're optimized by that one API layer underneath. So like when we put out our implementation of XGBoost, we use the one API data, analytic, data analytics library underneath to optimize that for our CPUs and GPUs. Um, similarly with, with, um, with NumPy in the, you know, in the numerical space, we opt, we use the math curl library to optimize that NumPy library. So it appears as a Python library to Python developers, but underneath the hood, it's really running optimized code, one API code using the data analytics library and uh, C++. Um, and then we have toolkits, both at this middleware and frameworks level, like Gretchen mentioned before, the, um, the AI analytics toolkit and the OpenVINO toolkits. They work more at that level, and then we have several toolkits at this this more native code level for one API, and we'll see those as we as we go forward. Okay, next slide. So the compatibility tool, um, and really this the goal of this is just to minimize code migration time. So certainly there's a lot of people that have accelerator code written in CUDA out there today, and so we want to provide this path to to help automate that. Um, it's intended to be a one-time code migration. It's not intended to be an automated path where you write in CUDA and then you, you, know, you flow through in DPC++ and just run the compiler. There's enough, you know, there may be architectural differences, especially if you're changing architectures from an NVIDIA GPU to an FPGA or something. There's probably going to be, you know, more tuning you'll need to do. Um, it won't be a completely automated path to, to complete code and performance. 
But what we see is that typically something like 90% of the code is, is transformed automatically. And then the developer goes in and, and we take a lot of pain to make sure that code is human readable. It isn't some kind of, you know, we've probably all seen translators run in and generate some code that a human couldn't really parse. Um, that's not the case here. It's, it's very good. It's deep, good DPC++ code with inline comments to help direct um, the developer on, on what they might need to do to, uh, to finish that for their device. And then once you have that DPC++ source code, it can be used, you know, targeted to any device that supports DPC++, whether that's from one of those third-party compilers I showed you or through the Intel compilers to, to our architectures. Okay, next slide. And then for the analysis and debug tools, I'll just do a quick uh, high-level summary. But we've got the Intel Advisor tool that helps um, design your, uh, your code. Um, and we've had that available for some time focused on uh, vector vectorization, so vector parallelism, finding opportunities for that in your code, and also um, threading opportunities. And now we've enhanced that to, to help guide you on where you might get the best benefit from GPU offload. So the idea is to, to run the tool across your source code. It would then identify, here's the regions where we think if you offloaded this to the accelerator, given, given the GPU you've told us you want to use, so you, so you would tell us like this, this Intel GPU or this one or this one, um, here's the code that we think would give you the most performance improvement and more than pay back you know, the data transfer cost you know, to, the, to the GPU memory, that kind of thing. So you don't have to do as much trial and error to figure that out. You've got a tool to, to help you um, identify some of those opportunities. And then for debug, it's a GDB. So, um, and it supports CPU, GPU, and FPGA. Um, pretty self-explanatory in terms of debug. FPGA, you don't get quite as much visibility into the in-depth debug, but, it, but it's still very helpful in terms of uh, figuring out where you need to get functional, uh, make functional changes for correctness. And then tuning with, with VTune Profiler, um, and again, this is a tool that's been around and has a, a good reputation in the industry, um, really shows you where things like your, your hot spots in your code that you might want to go pay attention to. So this is more of a you know, post um, advice and debug tuning step to make sure you understand if you have any you know, final bottlenecks you want to get rid of. And these tools do work across multiple you know, mixes of languages. So if you're you know, in the case of V2 and even Java, so you might have some Java UI code, you know, con communicating with C++ code underneath, et cetera. Um, so trying to provide you the best context to look at the full system performance. You know, is it, you know, is it memory to CPU where you have a bottleneck? You know, is it GPU to, where is it, right? That, the, the whole idea is that V2 will help check it out. Okay, next slide. Next slide, Richard. I'm still seeing the analysis and debug tool slide. All right, let's try this again. Still seeing that. I'm seeing the right one, so. Hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, one. yeah, it's now just way ahead now. Okay. <laughs> All okay. right, yeah. I'm back. sorry. <laughs> Let's get back up there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. We'll get there. Yes. You guys are getting a backwards preview here. <laughs> Are you seeing it now? Great. All right. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the toolkits then. So the tools we've talked about so far are, are really uh, all part of that one API based toolkit. So that's, that's the baseline, if you will, that everything else builds on. And then we have some add-on toolkits that, that work with the base kit, but they add a few other tools. So for instance, the HPC kit it adds Fortran. Um, the IoT tool, toolkit adds some things to offload to uh, or, or to communicate with data sources in the cloud. The rendering toolkit, there's a, there's a set of deep libraries for high fidelity visualizations. Um, and then the AI analytics toolkit and OpenVINO one. I'm going to talk about the contents of a few of these. I'm going to focus on HPC, AI analytics, and OpenVINO. 
Um, but I just wanted to show you that all of them here, the other IoT and rendering are a little more specialized, so we won't hit those today. Um, but, but, but just know that those are there as well. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so looking at the, the base toolkit, and again, we, we talked through most of these elements, um, but I just wanted you to see them uh, and add one or two other things. So um, in the direct programming column, think of this as language-based programming. So we've got the, the DPC++, C++ compiler, and it is a unified compiler across um, you know, both DPC++, C++, and, and of course C. Um, we've got the compatibility tool. We also include our, our Python distribution, just because while that's um, often used by AI developers, of course, Python use goes well beyond that. So we include that in the base as well. Um, and then we have this FPGA add-on. And that's important because if you want to do a full FPGA implementation, you actually have to run place and route. You have to do a physical compile of that. Um, so you can run it, you can do initial DPC++ code and emulate an FPGA and get, you know, sort of plus or minus 20% on what the performance would look like. But you have to do, use the, the back end, what, what, what we call Cordis tools for place and route to, to get a full FPGA with timing and everything. So that optional add-on is used by people who want to want to complete an FPGA design. Um, and then in the API-based programming, um, we talked through most of the libraries. There is one additional one, which is the, the Intel Integrated Performance Primitives Library. Um, that's, that works on CPU today. We'll, we'll be expanding that to other architectures in the future, um, but it's not quite yet in the, uh, in the One API standard, so, so it wasn't covered in that section. And then we talked about the analysis and debug tools. Um, okay, so next slide. Let's take a look at another toolkit. So here's the, the base, or I'm sorry, the HPC toolkit, and I show that, you know, added on to the base because they really work together. Um, but the ones in dark blue are the ones that are added by the HPC toolkit. Um, in the direct programming column, you see the, the Intel C++ compiler classic. Um, and what that is, is, you know, we had a previous compiler. The new compiler is all built on LLVM infrastructure, if you guys are familiar with, with that. Um, we have a, this is our previous compiler architecture, what we called IL0. Um, it was an Intel proprietary architecture. There are still some people that prefer to run that for some of their older workloads. They may have scripts and things like that, so, so we don't want to take that away. And that, that's been important to HPC developers, so we include that there. Um, similarly, we have our Fortran compiler, both the classic version based on that IL0 backend, as well as a new one based on LLVM that we still consider beta quality. Um, and that'll be, that'll be production quality soon and will be the way that we'll offload to our, uh, to our data center GPUs for HPC when those, when those come um, later this year. Then we've got the, in the API base or library column, we've got the Intel MPI library. MPI is obviously critical to, uh, to uh, cluster-based development for HPC. So that's why that one's there. Then we've got a few other analysis tools. We got Intel Inspector, which is mainly for some kind of deep um, memory um, correctness checking. We've also got the Trace Analyzer and Collector, which is really to, to work with MPI to look at cluster performance, so multi-node performance. And then Cluster Checker, which is, uh, which is more of a, a correctness tool just to, to check code for, uh, for readiness for, for cluster use. Okay, next slide. Um, the AI Analytics Toolkit, and I think Gretchen mentioned there had been a previous um, review of this in the, in the series, but if you missed that, I'll just quickly uh, talk about some of the components of that. Um, first of all, there's the optimized versions of TensorFlow and PyTorch. So these are the ones that Intel works very closely with the owners um, the, of, of those, TensorFlow, the main owner being Google, and PyTorch, the main owner today being, being Facebook, um, on enhancing those for our architectures. We also have what's called the low precision optimization tool. So this is a way to uh, take your, your trained models from TensorFlow and PyTorch and use those at a lower precision to get higher performance if, if you don't need like full 32-bit accuracy. So something like 8-bit integer or whatever um, data type you want to use there. 
and a model zoo, a, a collection of pre-trained models that may be useful, maybe um, usable for you if you if, and you don't need to train your own model from scratch then uh, using TensorFlow or PyTorch. So those are all there for deep learning. And then quite a lot of uh, optimized content for data analytics and machine learning. We've got the, the Intel distribution of Modin with an OmniSci backend um, for a lot of uh, data ingestion and, and other capabilities. Then we've got XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, and doll for pi which are all classic machine learning capabilities, XGBoost and Scikit-Learn being very popular open source projects uh, for machine learning, doll for pi being a, uh, a, a, some extra capabilities, particularly for distributed machine learning that, that aren't in those two libraries. And then NumPy, SciPy, and Pandas, more for general numeric compute, but very important in the AI analytics space as well. And all of those libraries are, as I mentioned earlier, optimized with the One API native code libraries to run at near native code performance, even though they're Python. So the uh, you know Python interpreter will will do the straight line code, but as soon as you make a call to one of those libraries, it's going to run at more native code speed. Next slide. And OpenVINO, and this is really focused on optimizing inference. So you, you can take your model you've, you've generated from or, uh, or done the learning in uh, PyTorch or, uh, or TensorFlow or, or other um, deep learning frameworks for that matter, and uh, move that model into OpenVINO and then really optimize that for deployment on a variety of different hardware. Um, there's also a lot of specific capabilities for media focused on visual inference, and you might want to do some pre and post processing there. Um, so while OpenVINO works for all kinds of inference, there's some, some special deep capabilities for, for visual inference that it, that it includes. Okay, next slide. Now, all of these toolkits are available uh, for free download. Um, that's a change. We, all of our tools, used, many of these used to be um, require paying for them. And I'll talk about you can, still can for priority support. But, but all the tools are available for free download, either from Intel's website, from repositories, or containers. Um, and then we also have them all available for use in what we call the Intel Dev Cloud. And that's a, a free sandbox where people can come run all these tools on all of our different architectures, um, all of the, the major release CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs, and in some cases, um, NDA access for special projects, early access. Next slide. But we do provide priority support for some of the toolkits. We haven't extended that to all of them yet today. But if you're, especially if you were a Parallel Studio customer in the past, Parallel Studio XE, that's now um, the commercial toolkit that replaces that is the base plus HPC. Um, and there's similar pricing. And, the, and really what priority support provides is, is, is beyond the, the, um, the forum support, the community forum support. So dedicated access to Intel support engineers, access to older versions if you need them, things like that. Um, and same with Intel System Studio for customers more in the I, IoT or system bring up space. Um, that's now been replaced by base toolkit plus IoT. We will likely add other priority support packages as we go forward, but those are the, the two that we have in place today. Next slide. And, and then I wanted to show just a quick example of, of, uh, of something that someone had done with One API to give you a feeling for, for how this works. Um, this is just high level, but um, if, you, uh, if you look up, if you're interested in going deeper on this one, the Zeus Institute of Berlin has actually presented a number of papers on this topic um, that you could Google or we could provide you links to um, so you get into the code at that level. But at the highest level here, they had a, a tsunami simulation application called EasyWave, and it was originally written in CUDA and uh, running on an NVIDIA P100 GPU. And they first ran that through the DPC++ compatibility tool. And they actually had very little um, unmigrated code. Mo mo almost all their code was migrated in this particular case. And they achieved strong performance with, with fairly minimal tuning. I think they had to do a little bit more on FPGA. But they were happy with the, with the performance, um, putting in only a few hours of tuning to each implementation. And the, uh, they, interestingly, they also took the code play 
NVIDIA GPU compiler that, that starts with Sickle and DPC++ and got very close to the original performance they had on the P100. They did that round trip. It's actually closer to 4% degradation performance. I'm going to put five here, um, and which, which uh, pretty much correlated to the lines of code. They went from about from uh, 5% uh, lines of code increase from going from CUDA to, to DPC++ as well. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, are we stuck again? Okay. I, so here's I'm just seeing, a little more. Yeah, I'm seeing the Intel Dev Cloud. Hopefully, it's showing up for you now. Yeah, yeah, we've got yes. that one. Thank okay, you. good. So, so just a little more detail on the Dev Cloud for you. Um, so we try to make this very easy. There is a a very quick approval process. We say one minute to code. We're really just trying to avoid people doing things like Bitcoin mining up there. This, this is, we're trying to save the bandwidth for developers. Um, the advantages are you don't have to, if you want to explore using a variety of Intel hardware, you don't have to acquire the hardware. You can use it all right there in the cloud. Um, you don't have to download, install, or configure tools. Um, so if you just want to try something out, kick the tires on any of these toolkits, you can do that um, easily and quickly. Um, and then lots of samples and tutorials. So when you log in up there, there's, you know, how to, you know, you know, develop DPC++ code in various areas, how to do this with AI frameworks, so a lot of different content and samples to make it easy to try things out, um, including use of Jupyter Notework, notebooks, which are really popular in AI, but, but expanding um, into other areas, kind of a live uh, code notebook, as well as Visual Studio Code, if you prefer that, um, that the IDE environment. Okay, next slide. Like the next slide's halfway up. I kind of see both of them. There we go. Um, and just to give you, you know, this is this is a big effort. Obviously, you know, it, this is probably the biggest developer tools initiative Intel has ever launched. And so there's extensive training. You know, we had we had a year long beta release. Actually, ten separate beta releases leading up to this. <coughs> Pardon me. And developed a lot of training content. So. Um, you know, um, we'll, we'll, we can link you to, to all that. Um, tons of content, both on, uh, on DPC++, the libraries, et cetera, um, soup to nuts. Um, academia, we've established these academic center of excellence around specific application development. Uh, Gromax is one of them that I mentioned earlier. Uh, NAMD is another major molecular dynamics code that we're developing. Um, along with a number of others um, that we're developing on one API, both internally and with uh, with experts in the community. Um, we also have an innovators effort. We have a, a large community beyond academia that likes to get started on, on new uh, new hardware and new software. Um, a number of them have published their projects on Def Mesh, and we had a, um, a whole summit in, um, with those folks. Um, that brings us to summit workshops. So a lot of hackathons and different workshops, uh, obviously all been uh, virtual these days. Um, but when we can go back to it, we'll do uh, do local ones as well. We also have a now a certified instructor, instructor program. So various consultants around the world that can help train organizations on using uh, one API. And, and we already covered dev cloud, of course, in terms of the, the developer sandbox. Next slide. Coming up slowly. And the next slide is just a bunch of other resources as well. So um, the, the main link is if you go to software.intel.com slash one API, most all these things will be linked from there. The industry initiative actually is on its own website, separate from Intel, one API.com. And so all that content is there as well. I think I'm going to go ahead and, and close out my presentation now, and let's go ahead and uh, look at some questions. Thank you so much, Kent. I appreciate it. And, and as Kent said, 
All of these uh, resources are available. We'll have um, the replay of this and all of those slides will be available within the next probably uh, 48 to 72 hours. So folks can view that. Um, and as we're pulling up some questions, I'll add one example, Kent, of one of our um, government customers who used one API. Um, I was honestly uh, someone within the FDA trying to do some work around crop analysis. And they'd already done all of their code um, written in CUDA. And so they went through and used the CUDA translator, found, as you said, five-ish percent of, of additional tweaking that they needed to do. But what they found was they were able to then look at a, a mode of different components and different products that they were going to have in the crop, in the fields themselves, collecting data. Um, and so they were able to leverage FPGA, um, Xeon, a number of other products to really be able to, to do better data capture. And in the end, didn't see that much of a performance degradation and were able to use multiple and in some cases less expensive product to be able to get that data and to really look and do the crop yield analysis they wanted to do. So that's another great example of somebody leveraging this tool and now being able to look at um, a number of different uh, products to be able to test on. Great. All right, and with that, we'll look at some of the questions that folks have. So somebody said they would like to understand um, where is the Oracle and Java community on leveraging this kind of a tool? Uh, I don't think we have any news on that, but I would say that, you know, this is that kind of fits into the uh, the powered by one API category in that if, if Java wants to leverage GPUs, they could use the one API libraries and, and DPC++ language to do that um, kind of under the hood and then just present Java APIs to their community. Um, but I don't think they've announced anything yet in terms of, of working with it quite yet. And Intel does have a pretty strong relationship already with Oracle. So I'll take that as a action to see if uh, there's any more information um, from our Oracle team because as Ken was saying earlier, we work really closely with Google and Facebook and others, um, and all of those optimizations are available on these resources pages that we say here, but you can even go to GitHub and um, look on the Intel, you know, the, the Intel um, pathway, so to speak, and be able to get most of these that are already optimized, which is terrific. And, and um, Greg Anderson, my boss, the head of our department, um, actually works directly with Oracle himself on this too. So he can help us out with that question. All right, perfect, perfect. So we will, uh, we'll take that and make sure any additional information, we'll have those, we'll work with Abby and the GovExec team and make sure that uh, additional information is provided. Um, another question that somebody has is they were curious to see um, where is IBM on this? Are they part of the One API consortium? Are they leverage any are they leveraging the tools? I actually uh, I work I'm, directly with them. Um, if you don't mind me responding real quick. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank actually, you, Jeff. I actually, I actually work directly with IBM myself on this. So it depends on which department on this is with. We've, um, depending on whether it's IBM Cloud, which yes, we have um, some cases that are initially starting to work on this uh, DP uh, data parallel, or what is it? I'm sorry, DB2 um, is um, not quite there yet, but. It, as far as using data parallel C++, that probably isn't an option for some of these departments. It's going to be more likely how we get it deployed to them, but I can get you more information on that. Terrific. Terrific. And another question is around be be benefits for development and adoption of if you're using a blockchain and, and that ledger support, um, and is there a zero trust uh, security as, as part of uh, one API? I don't think there's any explicit support for zero trust security. So if that was uh, it required, then we'd probably need to do some work. Um, on the blockchain ledger side, I guess it's mostly, you know, a lot of this is very accelerator focused. So to the degree they would want to use accelerators for that, it would be applicable. But if it's all CPU based, maybe, maybe there wouldn't be as much benefit for one API in that domain. Terrific. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, and um, and in terms of the overall zero trust and some of the security, um, Intel honestly is working um, on a project with the Navy where we are um, looking at secure supply chain and zero trust within that supply chain um, from basically sand all the way to the silicon and then the components that are sold you know, to a Lockheed or sold through an HPE or a Dell or others. So Intel overall is working quite closely with the government um, because many of our fabrication plants are indeed in the United States. Um, so we are working with them on those kinds of programs. So we can supply any um, additional information around that if that makes sense. Great. All right, I'm gonna ask if there are any other questions or Kent or um, folks, if there's anything else that you'd like to share? Because I think really... there's some under the Q&A tab. You were looking, you got in the chat already, I believe. But... I did, let me check. All right, let me check. Yes. All right. Yeah, it looks like there we are. Um, again, questions about blockchain uh, prototypes and wondering if this could help with their development. Right. So, so pretty much the same question, whether or same answer in terms of if uh, if they want to use accelerators for blockchain, I think it could be very applicable. Um, pure CPU, perhaps maybe not as much applicability there. So. Yes. And then um, there was another question that just came up on the chat, um, specifically talking about Microsoft, um, where they've included some additional security enhancements um, and do the one API accelerators um, work with the Microsoft hardware based security. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that one. Yeah, we'll have to find out. Now, I know as an example, Microsoft, if you're talking about like Microsoft Surface, Different question, we'll make sure, but I know that Microsoft as a as a company working with Intel is leveraging a lot of our um, MKTME or our memory encryption technology, and then also our um, security guard uh, enhancements. And those are ultimately um, what Microsoft is leveraging within their own suite of products, and then also on Azure. Um, and then there's a question about um, APIs with ARM. So, as Kent had mentioned, really what one API is, is to be broader. So it's not just on our product. Um, the truth is in many cases, an AMD or other products will leverage our tools and see um, performance improvements themselves. So we do understand that we wanna make it as easy as possible to move between the multiple architectures that are available. But I'll let, I'll let Jeff and Kent jump in too. Well, in fact, on ARM specifically, that's where we have the, the implementation of one DNA. Um, that was done by Fujitsu. On the, the Fugaku supercomputer is actually the number one supercomputer in the world right now, and it's all ARM-based. And my understanding is that they, they worked with, with ARM on some of that as well. So we're hopeful that that means there's more sign that ARM will, will buy into more of these standards, but so far one DNN is the, the one that's implemented. Got it, got it, that's great. Well, we don't have any other questions that, ooh, uh, no, I don't see that we have any other questions now, but um, we'll monitor the chat. And um, if Kent or Jeff have any other comments or additional information, we'll, we'll wrap this up and um, provide, as I said, the, uh, the replay, any additional questions that we've taken on that we will provide those answers and then we'll give everybody um, about eight minutes back so that they can prep for their next calls or get a cup of coffee or something like that.
Yeah, I would just, if I can just add one thing, and Gretchen, sure. if, if I can be of any assistance to anybody at all, my primary focus for the verticals that I handle are going to be uh, government entities, um, academic and government entities. So if there's anything that I can do, I'll, I'll verbally give you my, or I guess I could put it in the chat here real quick, uh, my email address. If I can help anybody with any questions that they have on this directly, I'm not trying to bypass Gretchen on this too, but if there's anything on that, and I'll make sure and keep Gretchen in the loop on this as well too, but if you need help getting licenses you need help with support you have a project you want to work on let us know those kind of things we have um, we have availability of um, engineering staff that we can um, help you with any more from questions to maybe on a um, particular project you might be working on so I'm going to put my email address in here don't hesitate to reach out and, um, and Gretchen I'll keep you in the loop oh yeah no thanks you so much Jeff and you know one thing I, I'm not sure if I mentioned or not but um, as I said, the, the outer ring to all the work that we're working on is absolutely software and Intel as a company has somewhere between 15 and 16,000 software engineers. So we absolutely understand the more we uh, democratize this developer opportunity, then you can be running it on multiple products um, and be able to get the best performance and get time, faster time to results. So. Um, with that, I will say thank you very much. We really appreciate everybody attending. Great questions. And we look forward to the next session that we, uh, we do with God Exec. So again, thanks so much. And thanks to the speakers. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, everybody, for attending for, and for putting this on. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.